Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Parker. I'm a volunteer here at Anchor. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving, celebrated our recent victory over the turkeys. Now that Thanksgiving's over, that means that we can start decorating for Christmas, start playing Christmas music. So service is going to start in about five minutes so you can grab some of your leftover turkey and settle down and view the service.
morning, Anchor Church. So glad that you're here. Uh, glad that you're here to hear from God's Word with us. I uh, hope you had a good Thanksgiving full of good food and turkey and absolutely no Ronas anywhere to be seen. Real quick, I just wanted to read a verse to you guys. Psalm chapter 148, verses 1 through 3. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. And praise Him, all His heavenly armies. Today, we get the opportunity to praise the Lord our God. So go ahead and get your heart ready as we be prepare to worship the Lord our God.
Well, Thanksgiving is officially over. We can now sing Christmas music. Oh, yes, I'm sure you're as glad as I am. Uh, that's a fun song we just worship the Lord together with. I loved the change there. It preps us for our next sermon series. All of our campuses online at North, South, and West will be in a brand new sermon series starting next week called Adore. We're going to look at the reasons why we ought to come and adore Christ the King. Thank you for joining us today for a special Thanksgiving weekend. You might not have felt like Thanksgiving was really Thanksgiving to you, but hopefully this sermon and this video will get your heart right to show gratitude to the Lord and those around you. Check out the screen here. Though I wake to a world with more questions than answers, where dissonant voices ignite division, my heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. And though the struggles I face may be painful, Though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed, and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice. But it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone. I choose thankful. Hey Anchor Church, so glad to be here. So glad to be filling in for Carl and to preach to you guys. Sad it's not uh, face to face and in person, but either way, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope you at least got to see some people socially distanced and wearing a mask, safe, but hope you had a good holiday. So today I'm going to be preaching on Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. And so there's a common theme in here uh, that I picked up on that I really wanted to kind of make the centerpiece of this sermon, and that is hitting markers of growth in our faith. And, um, you know, it really just kind of brought to mind of when I was a kid, and I'd have my parents measure how tall I was, right, you know, on like the door frame or on the wall uh, as I was growing. I was the oldest of three, so I flaunted that I was the tallest, but it didn't last long. I think my brother's the same height as me, probably a little taller, but I was the tallest at one point, and that's what matters. Anyway, Philippians, uh, just some unique things about Philippians is it's a very warm and loving letter from Paul. Um, very affectionate with this church. You can tell he knew these people personally. Um, from when he started this church to when he wrote this letter, it's probably about 10 years. So the church had obviously grown and matured more since then. Um, but really, this letter is full of a lot of love and affection. And there's a couple things he warns them against, like Jewish legalism and having confidence in the flesh and things like that. Um, but for the most part, this is really just building up the church with love and affection. He's also updating them on him being in prison. And he's like, <laughs> kind of sucks, but I get to preach the gospel to everyone that is comes by me. I will preach the gospel. And so... Um, we see the events of him starting this church in Acts chapter 16. And so you don't have to flip there, but I'm just going to do a brief recap of it. Um, 
but Paul's trying to go to Asia originally, and the Holy Spirit's blocking him from going in there. And he gets a vision of a Macedonian man, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he's like, Paul, we need you over here. We need you to preach the gospel in Macedonia. So Paul's like, all right, that's where God wants me. So he packs up his stuff, goes to Macedonia, and he goes to Philippi. So Philippi at the time would have been like Dallas. Like it would have been like a big city for its time. Is it is, you know, a thriving city. And so Paul goes there with Silas, and they're looking for a synagogue, and they don't find one, but they find a group of women uh, sitting at a river outside the town. And so Paul's like, perfect, people. So he goes up, shares the gospel, and there's a lady there named Lydia, who's a dealer in purple cloth. So today's equivalent, that would be like a fashion designer, right? So she's done like really well for herself. She has a home where she's able to host several people, Paul, Silas, and a couple other believers. So she's got a big home. She's got multiple homes too. So she's done really well for herself. And uh, the Bible notes her as being a woman who fears God. So really all that means is she had rejected the paganism of the day and was really kind of leaning towards uh, Yahweh, right? And he's like, I see who the Jews are worshiping. I think that's true. So Paul comes along, connects the dots, boom, she's saved. She gets baptized, her and her household. And uh, Paul and Silas move on to go share with other people. And they encounter this slave girl who's possessed with a demon that helps her predict the future. This is a weird story, but Paul is annoyed with her, okay? So she's following them around and screaming at the top of her lungs, um, these men here who proclaim to you a way of salvation are servants of the Most High God. So she's screaming that at the top of her lungs, and Paul is annoyed because he's trying to share the gospel, and this girl's like screaming everywhere they go. You know, I can't imagine sharing the gospel like that, but Paul finally turns to her and goes, in Jesus' name, boom, be healed. And that demon's gone, right? And so the people who own this girl see immediately, oh, there goes our, pos- or our that, there goes our money. We can no longer make un- income off this girl. So they take Paul and Silas, bring him to the authorities, and uh, they did not like Jews at the time. So they're like, these Jews are promoting practices us Romans can't practice. That's not true. He just took away their money or their ability to make money off this girl. But the authorities are like, yeah, sure, why not? So they throw him in jail. Now, this is where they encounter the jailer, okay? God sends an earthquake, shakes, shakes the whole jail, all the doors open, chains fall off him, and the jailer's about to kill himself. And Paul's like, wait, 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 stop. We're all still here. Don't kill yourself. And he gets an opportunity to share the gospel, and the jailer and his household become part of the church. So this is the, the Philippian church that he's writing to. He knows all these people. He has a relationship with them. Um, These people have nothing in common, right? Lydia, the fashion designer, the slave girl who was uh, saved from this demon and had become a believer and was baptized, and the jailer um, have nothing in common. But the gospel, that is what holds them together. So Paul, starting in, uh, so back to Philippians, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Paul's introducing himself, saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's introducing himself, saying like, hey, it's Paul. You remember me? I'm teaching you about Jesus, right? And it's important that he does that because there's a lot of letters flying around from a lot of different people, and most of them are false teachings. And so, and he's reminding them right off the bat what unites them is Christ, right? The grace and peace from God. And so that's what cuts across all these social categories that these people are from and unites them as one unique community. So going on down verses three and four, uh, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always praying for you with joy and constantly praying for you. So Paul's just saying, he's showing deep affection for the church. He's saying, every time I remember you, I thank God for you. I'm so thankful. I I pray with joy for you. Um, He's just really building them up. And why is he so thankful for them? Well, here down in verse 5, he answers that. It says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So these people, since day one when they became believers, when they became a church, they partnered with Paul in the gospel. And that word 
partnership here, it's going to get a little nerdy here, bear with me, but it's the Greek word koinonia. And so the word koinonia, if you were to break it down a little bit, it's basically participation fellowship. Okay? The act of, or a definition I was able to pull was the act of sharing in the activities or privileges of an intimate association or, uh, or group, especially used of marriage and churches. So as a group, as a church, and we as well, as a church, they are partaking in the forgiveness of God and His grace and actively striving to share the gospel. So they're a fellowship, they all have in common grace of God, and they're participating in sharing the gospel. So um, we see how this church is really leaning in on this partnership. They're really leveraging all that they have to make sure the gospel is spread around them, but also to help Paul in his ministry. Um, in Philippians 2.25, Paul says, uh, I, thought, uh, I thought it necessary to send you back your brother Epaphroditus, right? He goes on to call him a brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. This guy that the Philippian church had raised up, equipped this guy to be a leader, and then financially supported him, sent him over to Paul to go help Paul and assist him in his ministry, help building tents, sharing the gospel. Um, we also see later on in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, um, he's saying, uh, And you Philippians, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in the giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help again and again. So he's saying, man, in the beginning, nobody partnered with me but you guys. You guys are awesome. You guys have supplied my needs time and time again. And so um, we also get to see how God feels about this, about, about churches who do this. Philippians chapter 4, 18. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So God views churches that do this as it's a pleasing thing to him. It's an acceptable sacrifice. You know, in this church, they're, so they're fully leaned in in this partnership. And, and what's their motivation? It's the grace that has transformed their lives. It's the grace that has burdened their hearts for the lost and has transformed their hearts to want to glorify God. And so, uh, bear with me here, but I'm going to brag on you guys for a second. I don't really know you that well, and I'm bummed about it. So I talked to Carl for a little bit, just kind of getting to know you guys. And I got to say, after COVID's over, we have to hang out. But um, one thing that, and Carl didn't even mention this, but this is something that I noticed before I even talked to Carl. Obviously, you guys were a church before you replanted with us at Anchor. So the very fact that you guys are a core group that are still committed, still coming to church, still going, even through this whole transition period, that is huge and monumental. And honestly, that's a huge blessing to Carl that you guys have remained so committed, still coming, still tithing, and still um, having love for each other. And so um, some of the things that Carl mentioned that you guys had done um, is that you guys have been faithful to give to the Baptist Convention. So you guys are supporting mission efforts to go and spread the gospel. You're also supporting ministries that the convention does, um, that God is working in and through. You guys also helped pack boxes of food for the Navajo Nation when they needed this, or when they needed it in this weird season of, of, of COVID. You guys have uh, been generous to, to help families uh, in times of need uh, that were impacted by COVID. You guys uh, just launched a children's ministry, he told me, and let's be honest, there's some children's ministries that are more like daycares, and there's nothing wrong with that. Those are needed. But you guys' children's ministry strives to teach children the truths of God, scriptural truth. That way you're, you're helping to form these kids' uh, worldview to be a biblical worldview. You're, you're leading them and guiding them to Christ. Um, you're also raising up people to be leaders like Josh. Um, what else are you guys doing? You guys... Another thing that Carl was adamant about was that you guys have love for one another. Even in this weird COVID season, you guys are using technology, texting each other, messaging each other, checking in. How can I pray for you? Sharing burdens with one another. 
And it really brought to my mind the verse of John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And you know, these actions may seem insignificant when you're doing them. It may kind of seem like, oh man, you know, I just do this week in, week out. I tithe, I, I show up or I message. And um, it may not seem significant, but it is a big deal. These actions don't make you Christians. They don't make you a church. But these actions that you're doing testify to what God is doing in and through you. So it's like evidence of your faith. It's markers that you have hit as you've grown in your faith that you guys have been just doing an awesome job at. And so um, to kind of go back to the verses, uh, starting in verse 6, um, Paul goes on to keep building up the church. He says, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul's building all this time, uh, building them up, you know, praising them and all these kind of things. You guys are doing awesome. You guys are in our partnership. You guys have been phenomenal to hit, to supply my needs and all these things like that. And um, he's saying, you guys are growing in your faith and I'm confident that God will bring your, your faith to completion. And his faith here is not hanging on the Philippians, how great they're doing, all that kind of stuff. It's his faith is rooted in God. You know, Paul, you know his story. He On the Damascus Road, he encountered God face to face, right? He encountered Jesus face to face. His, he was blinded, scales fall off, fell off his eyes. So he experienced God in a very intense way, right? His heart was changed radically overnight. And so his experience with God, seeing what God had done for him, is what gave him such a great confidence that the Philippians church, their faith, God was going to bring that to completion. And so, again, so he's bringing up all these markers of growth, right, that, you're, that they're hitting, right? And so um, he dips back into that really warm, loving, and affectionate languages in verses 7 through 8, saying, It is right for me to feel this way about you, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment, the defense, and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn, for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, man, I'm proud of you guys. I love you. You guys are amazing. You guys have supplied my needs. Um, when he's saying here, you're partakers of grace in my imprisonment, what he's saying here is, when I was imprisoned, you were sympathetic to me. You, you came, you gave me food, you gave me clothes, you gave me money when I was in jail. When I needed, you, you know, when I needed people the most, you were there for me. And also when he's saying, um, you are partakers in grace in both the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He's saying these markers that you've hit, the way that you've been growing, the way you live your faith, it defends and confirms the gospel for those around you. For people who may not have heard the gospel or anything like that, you guys are a living example of that. And you guys are doing awesome at it. And so this is where he starts to shift gears. And this is verses 9 through 11. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he spent all this time pouring into them, loving on them, showing them how they've been growing. And then he says, you guys are doing a great job and I want to see you guys keep doing a great job. These are markers that I want to see you hit now that you've made it this far. And so he's very specific in this. It's love, knowledge, and discernment. And so um, Paul wants to see them grow in love. And this is just Christ-like love, right? That is all-encompassing, that, that burns our heart for the lost, uh, gives us a desire to glorify God and serve wherever we can. And it's important that we're that Paul couples knowledge with love because love alone doesn't necessarily cut it every time. You know, you, you need to have knowledge that guides this love. Uh, a good example of this is I was watching my son, Carter. I don't know if you know, but I'm married. I have a son, Carter, and he's about a little over a year now, year and three months. And I was watching him while my wife was at work. And so we're hanging out, just kind of a dude's day. We're hanging out. And um, I just start noticing he's crying more and he's whining more. And I'm like, what is going on? Carter, dude, 
You're not like this normally. And so I'm like, well, let's go, let's go wrestle on the floor. And he's just not having it. I'm like, oh, you want to read a book? No, not having it. I'm like, what? So I pull out the big guns. It gets serious. And I call mom. I'm like, mom, what the heck is going on? What? Why is he like this? And my wife goes, well, did you feed him a snack? I'm like, his snack. She's like, yeah, he normally eats around like 9.30, 9.30, 9 o'clock. I look over the clock and it's like 10.59. I was like, gotcha. Okay, bye. Hang up and I feed him a snack. All is well with the world. So I loved my son and I wanted to see him do well and not be all upset, but I had no clue he needed his snack. Dad dropped the ball. And so it's an example of love, just love alone, doesn't always cut it. We need to have our love guided by knowledge, by, by scripture, by correct doctrine from the word of God. And so that's what Paul's saying here. You need to, I want to see you guys grow in love that's guided by knowledge and discernment so that we can understand where God's leading us, understand what God wants us to do. And when we do these things, Paul goes on to say, um, why, why do we do these things? Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and be so pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he's saying, I want you guys to grow in these so that when Jesus comes back, you guys can be counted as pure and blameless, having made every opportunity that God gave you, leveraging every gift and talent that God is giving you, that you have leveraged it all for the gospel. And so when we do these things, he says we're filled with the fruit of righteousness, right? It's the same fruit in Galatians 5, 22 um, and 23. Uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, when we hit these markers of love, discernment, and knowledge, we're filled with these fruit. We just can't, you can't help it. You're obedient to God. You're doing what God wants you to do. And so, as you grow in your faith, you're growing in that love, discernment, and knowledge, you're able to discern where God is leading you individually and corporately. And so, how do we do this? How do we grow in these ways? How, how does this apply to us? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so, there's a couple of things you can do, and I really encourage you to write these down if you, if you can. So first of all, pray, okay? Just pray to the Lord. Pray for a heart softened to God's voice, that you would hear his Holy Spirit and where he's guiding you and leading you. And pray that God would speak to you clearly. You know, there's times where I pray, I'm like, God, speak to me clearly and then give me wisdom and understanding so I can understand what it is you're saying, right? So pray that God would soften your heart, speak to you clearly, and also Pray for opportunities to grow. Pray, say, God, I don't see any opportunities for me to share the gospel or to serve in my church or things like that. Pray, and I promise you, God will bring these opportunities up. Second is to read the Bible. Get to know the scripture, right? Know it on a deep level. I'm not talking about just surface level reading, but read it like three times in a row. Get to know what the author is saying. Get to know the concepts in it and stuff like that. And if you struggle to, to understand what Scripture says, man, reach out to, to Carl or any of us here at Anchor, and we'd love to help you. But also, I would also tell you, the more Scripture you read, the more you can understand it. And, and all that means is, typically you'll find if you're struggling with something in the New Testament to understand, well, what are they talking about? Usually, there's stuff in the Old Testament that you can read that will bring it in a new light that will help you understand what the author is saying. And last but certainly not least, look for these opportunities. Is there someone that you see that maybe is not quite so far along in the faith as you that you could reach out to and disciple? Is there someone that you see that you're like, man, I want to be like them. I want to have a faith like theirs. Ask them to disciple you. Um, go share the gospel. So it, you'll usually find You'll run into someone and you'll think, oh man, I should share the gospel. You hear the Holy Spirit kind of leading you. Go share, go share. And you're like, oh, I, I don't think I can do that. I would really encourage you to step out on that branch. Just talk to them. Just bring up God. Just start the conversation. Break that ice. 
and you would be surprised. The Holy Spirit's usually reading you, leading you for a reason. And so there are plenty of opportunities to grow and serve. You just got to look for them. Pray for them, look for them, and be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they will come. I just, again, want to encourage you guys. You guys are an awesome church. Getting to talk to Carl, get to know you guys. You guys have done so much, and you've made so much progress. And I'd love to see you guys continue on this faith, this journey of faith, and hit these other markers and continue to grow and mature as a church. And if you, and if you listening to this, think to yourself, man, all this sounds awesome, but I don't even know how to start any of this. If you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I really encourage you to go to anchorchurch.com, reach out to one of us, click on the contact us link, shoot us an email. We'd love to talk to you. And if you have not accepted the gospel, I really encourage you to accept the gospel. Um, pray, acknowledge your sin before the Lord. Tell him I know, or I, that you believe that his son died on the cross for you and trust in that. Put your faith and your trust in that. And I promise you, you will not be let down. The Lord will will save you. And so, um, again, I'm so thankful to be able to be here, preach my first sermon to you guys, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pray for us, and then you guys are, you guys are good. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Anchor West. I thank you so much for Carl. He's, he's just an awesome guy. Huge blessing to Anchor as a whole, and uh, Lord, I thank you for each and every one of the members of Anchor West, and I pray that you would continue to grow them in their faith, Lord, that you would be leading them to to look for opportunities and seek those out, but also to grow in love, grow in knowledge, grow in discernment, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the fruits of righteousness. Lord, all these things I pray in your name. Amen. Thanks, Anchor West.